Welcome to Progenesis Academy. This is webinar number 21. Today's topic is a comprehensive review of embryo culture systems. And we have a pleasure to have 15. Now, apparently only 14. We, we're waiting for number 15 to join. We have 15 laboratory directors across the country. Uh, and this is a great opportunity for all the embryologists to exchange experience and share their, their personal experience with, with the culture and system. Um, we, uh, since we have a long list of speakers, we're going to try to be within two to three minutes presentation, and then we will have, we will get all the questions from the embryologists and the audience, and then we will discuss them after the, uh, the, the last presentation. Um, and now we're going to start with the first speaker. Uh, Klaus will be presenting the first uh, PowerPoints. Excellent. So thanks everybody for attending this, the webinar. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about how we do our culture systems here at Palmer Fertility. <clears throat> going to go over the hows and whys of what we do. Next slide. So just a little bit of background on how we chose our culture system. Want to mention that we use carbon potassium permanganate air filtration. We change these filters out on a regular basis. We have about 22 air exchanges an hour. And when we test for our VOCs in our lab, we routinely come in under 400 parts per billion. We use a single step culture system that was validated. Uh, we wanted to validate to make sure that we could culture in the same drop for six days, just to make sure the environment wasn't impacting things. So we first measured pH and osmolarity of dishes after three and six days. So we've always used a single step system. I have never believed in sequential systems. Um, we put one embryo per drop uh, because we're, we want to evaluate how each individual embryo is growing. Uh, we, do, we only do assisted hatching on poorly developed embryos, pH media, uh, once a week or every new lots. And we check surface temperatures of our culture surfaces or the uh, incubators every day and culture drops once uh, a quarter. Next slide. So this shows kind of how we do. We culture in these Life Global Universal dishes. Uh, we use these because this plastic has been MEA tested and is specifically designed for embryo culture. We get great, great clarity on the bottom of these dishes. Our micro drops are 15 to 20 microliters. We use 11 and a half mLs of Life Global oil that's been washed with HTF. And it's super important to have two millimeters of oil over the top of the dish because we have found through experience that this reduces the amount of evaporation. We found if you have less than one millimeter of oil, you can have evaporation in the dish. And we've been using this culture system now for about three years and been really happy with it. Be glad to answer questions in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am the law director at Dallas IVF. And of course, you know, which media type to use is certainly um, a, something that all of the labs struggle with because there are so many media out there. Here at Dallas IVF, we do use a single step media also. I do find that um, we get better results with that. And I'll show you that in just a second. Um, what the parameter here is that. Um, Culture media, of course, we group culture. We culture in micro drops of 40 microliters per droplet. And we try to limit to four to five embryos per drop. We replenish our media on day one and on day five and assisted hatch only embryos that are um, planned for a PDC or speculum biopsy. We do pH each new lot and we use the ISTAT by Abbott um, to go ahead and do that. Temperatures, uh, we monitor temperatures of chambers continuously using MESA monitoring system through Z-Point. And we also have um, periodic QC in which we monitor drop temperatures of specific dishes that we use for embryo culture um, on different surfaces. Key, point, uh, key um, indicators that we monitor also are blockage conversion rate. 
implantation and ongoing pregnancy and live birth rates, partial pressures of CO2 and O2, and also pH of each culture media with each new lot. Um, we're looking at embryo attrition rate and also intratech comparisons per procedure and handling event. Next slide, please. We, right before we switched over from sequential to continuous, we did a sibling study in which we found that percent positive chemical pregnancy rate um, was higher in the continuous media group. Um, and then also ongoing pregnancy was higher in the continuous media group. The implantation rate was slightly lower by 7%, 7.8%. 7 7 um, but overall, we saw that there was an improvement in the single set culture media. Some of the advantages of continuous um, or single set media are also that there is a reduction in handling errors. There's a decrease in embryonic stress when it comes to temperature and pH fluctuations due to reduced handling of the media or the dishes. There is a reduction in the overall cost and materials used when you're using single set media in your lab. And then also compatibility with time lapse systems is a huge advantage in that AI can, statistical tools can be implemented in the lab to improve outcomes and look for um, uh, ways to improve in the laboratory, morphokinetic parameters, marketing advantages, such as patients can access um, lab images of their embryos during development. Next slide. Um, some of the key concerns of uh, media and when selecting media is composite composition. So here, uh, what's very different with single step versus sequential is that the composition has to be such that there should be a simultaneous choice of concentrations of components um, within the media system because they are all interdependent. If you look at the graph on the right, um, you'll see that as the component um, one is being used up, the entire graph, which is three-dimensional, will adjust and change um, um, to then respond to the concentration of component two. So now if you can imagine all of the different components or various components in the culture system, they are constantly fluctuating in the three-dimensional environment. And so, it, and especially since the media is used for a period of five days, um, then that can drastically impact um, the, the quality of the medium. And so what's really important is that ammonium buildup is limited because a stable form of glutamine, L-glutamine, is included in the culture system. Um, and if you look at, um, on the bottom left, you'll see that three, in, a, in one of the studies, three different um, culture systems were compared in concentrations of glucose, lactate, and pyruvate in millimolar concentration. And you'll see that in some um, areas that are two to three fold higher or lower. But what is consistent in all of the culture systems is the um, lactate to pyruvate ratio. So that is certainly important and has kept um, more stable rates when it comes to outcome. Some of the key factors that also impact outcome are ratio of the number of embryos to media volume, um, CO2, O2, pH, and temperatures, handling technique, and um, and I can't see the last slide, and, oh, and handling technique. So that should be considered when selecting medium for your particular laboratory. Thank you. Uh, Zeki, are you there, Zeki? All right, do you guys hear me now? Perfect. All right, sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I mean, thanks, thanks for the invitation. Also, thanks for everybody to come and joining us for this discussion. Uh, as just for just to be concise and uh, to the, to be seeing the uh, time limits we have here, so I'd like to just go over and then just tell you, a, you know, a summarize what we have currently in our uh, system, which is, uh, which is Fertility and IVF Center in Miami. Uh, after that, I just wanted to just give a, a quick summary of what, what, what's my take on the uh, embryo culture systems uh, in general, overall, based on my experience. Well, currently, that's what we, this is what we have uh, going on in our system, in our uh, clinic right now. All ICSIs, 100% uh, ICSI. We use a single step medium, which is uh, global total uh, currently. 
and we renew the media on day one, and we try to keep the pH uh, of the media between 7.25 to 7.25, and of course it is low oxygen environment. And for the pH checks, we use uh, ISTAT, uh, blood gas analyzer, and we uh, use it only for uh, new lots of medium, basically. And uh, the, the gas environment is provided by a pre premixed gas rather than just mixing up uh, uh, the, by the incubator or so. And of course, the temperature uh, is uh, you know, controlled, I mean, controlled and uh, monitored regularly. Uh, we use a group culture uh, in uh, large uh, non uh, four well dishes, five embryos per well, about 500 microliter media in each. And uh, we hatch the embryos on day three if they're go if they're going to go to a, a PGT uh, if they're PGT cases. And uh, almost everything blastus is not almost uh, everything is blastus is transferred. Um, uh, morphological grading uh, is done on day three, at day five, and day six, and uh, we just go with that. Uh, our uh, incubators are humidified benchtop incubators. All right, next slide, please. So if, first of all, be, before going into why we use the system, I'd like to, as you can see from the title of the uh, uh, slides, you, I mean, I came to the conclusion that after, after just uh, almost trying, uh, uh, every possible uh, culture system available. I mean, the, those single cell, I have a single medium, single step medium, uh, continuous, uh, single cell, single embryo, uh, group culture cell, thanks to a, a very hyperactive mentor I had in the past. <laughs> we, tried, we tried all of these, but it's not, I'm not just, this, this trial is not just basically going and uh, trying to see what's happening. It was a systematic, uh, comparison of what we have. I mean, we always have global system, based media culture system, and we tried everything on split uh, all size and embryos and in a systematic manner. And after all of these, to be honest, I mean, I came to uh, my co my conclusion, overall conclusion is that if if we just basically uh, pay attention to certain uh, aspects of the system uh, and make uh, the adjustments uh, as needed, uh, I, I believe that multiple systems are going to be implemented successfully. I mean, by successful implementation, I mean we uh, we're going to have uh, overall uh, success rates for a majority of the cases. And I believe that I really believe that, that it is a possible. It is it is possible, but uh, of course uh, each system needs to be checked and adjusted according to uh, that specific laboratory's needs, basically. And. As I, as I mentioned, when it comes to choosing the system, it is the main com main issues here is going to be uh, the what's available to the lab, what's uh, what's available to that lab, and what is what is uh, uh, what is, what makes sense in terms of uh, the needs of the physicians or the or the overall uh, patient needs. In that sense, uh, I I believe that I mean, we can implement all of, all of these successfully. Why do we do it? For instance, I mean, in terms of what we are doing right now, here is a some of, uh, I am a, uh, I'm a, I'm a new uh, lab director here in the system. So some of them are inherited basically. And uh, for instance, the group culture uh, is, is, is done here mainly because we have a, you know, habit of just taking a very extensive picture documentation so it makes life easier in that sense. That, that's, that's, that's one of the main reasons. To be honest, I mean, I prefer a single, single uh, embryo culture and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm planning to implement that, but of course, by uh, making uh, I mean, appropriate adjustments and controls and everything, I'm planning to switch the system at this point based on my previous experience, experience that's uh, much better or, uh, much informative as uh, as uh, uh, as Klaus mentioned. I mean, you can have the information about the single embryo, uh, single embryo from uh, from start to start to the end of the culture. So that's a that's a plus for me, and I uh, I'm I'm working on that one. But this is uh, some, an inherited system uh, basically at the moment. Humidified uh, bench type incubators. Again, it's it's come down to the lab resources, what's available in the lab. But but again, I tried dry, dry incubators. Uh, humidified incubators, and uh, again, as as you pay attention and uh, mod modify your uh, uh, 
factors affecting your culture, that's going to be uh, definitely, uh, you know, that's going to be workable in both environments. But humid, I'm happy with humidified incubators I have. But in the past, I used dry ones. They were just, just not, just fine as well. As Anna said, as far as we uh, concerned about the making or introducing changes, uh, I believe that every lab has their own uh, setting, and it requires depending on the environment, where you are, uh, what uh, what are the needs of the uh, physicians, patients. Uh, each each lab is a specific environment, and. Uh, when we are going to do any changes or we're going to introduce any system, any new systems or any new, uh, uh, you know, tests or any any factors in the lab, that that is that should be tested in that environment. Uh, that's 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 critical for me. I mean, after uh, years of testing or using different systems, I came to believe that that is. The, I mean, every single system should be tested or uh, adjusted to that specific laboratory. As long as we do that, and as long as we uh, we you know adjust uh, like special typical and very critical uh, factors like pH, uh, temperature, and uh, the uh, I mean pH temperature and uh, gas uh, environment. As long as we just uh, uh, keep them under control, we can we can use more than one system, and it should be tested on each environment individually, and that's the, the that's what we should go with. And as far as the routine service concern, I mean, once you establish the service, I mean, this is a, this is a typical, this is what we try to do. We try to give our patients our best in terms of uh, the results. So if something, if we just come up and establish a system that works, well, basically st we stick with this one. That's my philosophy, actually. As long as it's working, just fine. But of course. We are all uh, science background, uh, and we are all scientists to start with this whole process. So we got to, we are, I mean, uh, again, my philosophy is we should be curious about what's happening, uh, see uh, the new technologies, new research, and what's uh, coming into the laboratory. But of course, always critically test those, and then after that, implement it. That's my, that's my overall take uh, on the culture system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thank you for having us all here. And this is like speed dating. So this is gonna be um, a quick background about RSC of the Bay Area. What I know about doing this is there's a lot of right ways to do IVF. So just a little background. We do about 1600 retrievals here. 90 plus percent of those are ICSI now. The vast majority of our cycles are done with um, PGT, about 20% freeze all without PGT, and only about 5% of transfers are done fresh. Um, all of those are blast transfers, and whenever we can, we do ESET. We do laser-assisted hatching on the morning of day three. We don't grade them, we just take them out, hatch them, put them back. Um, and we will, if there's something really obvious, we'll make notes about it, but otherwise we just move on. About 1,500 FETs, 99.5% of those are single embryo transfer. Next slide. So with regard to the culture system, um, we might do things a little bit differently. We use a Harrisel. We equilibrate dishes overnight in 6% CO2 and air. But everything after that, from the post-retrieval through day six culture, is done in a mink with a custom mixed gas of 7% CO2. 5% O2. Uh, we do one dish change at the fertilization check. We use the SAGE one-step medium. So they're in the fertilization medium overnight, and then we do the fur check in the morning, and they are moved and not, not, not dish changed again. So in the bottom left, we use a large drop culture around 200 microliters with oil overlay, about three cumulus oocyte complex with um, per drop, and the same with ICSI for overnight fertilization. We do group culture about three to four embryos per drop day one through day six. Most of our patients are PGT, so after biopsy, they go into the GPS dish where they're just cultured until vitrification. We do temperature checks every day. We do monitor the CO2. Um, next slide. Always choose ESET and always wear your mask. Thank you. 
you so much. Okay, I'm David Weininger. I'm at uh, Atlantic Reproductive Medicine in Raleigh. And just want to go a little, talk a little bit about our embryology lab at first. We use MIRI countertop incubators for all culture, and they're a dry incubator, uh, no humidity. Uh, we do our oocyte retrievals, embryo transfers, and an isolate. Uh, CO2 and O2 check daily with a bias sensor. And as you know, with all of these uh, sensors, you have to do annual recertification. Um, pH of media perform weekly and with new lots. Uh, the MERI temperature is verified with a digital thermometer. And we use OSAFE mouse embryo testic plasticware uh, throughout. We use all of our dishes, tubes, and specimen containers. They're all mouse embryo tested. Um, so we don't do any in-house testing. Um, we use the OSAFE spray for disinfecting and cleaning. And uh, we also have a large donor program and we recruit our own donors. Uh, next slide. Um, now culture, uh, we collect the eggs, of course, in a modified media and four well dishes. Uh, after they're trimmed and stripped, they're put into whole dishes of global total. Uh, we use 60 millimeter dishes, uh, 50 microliter drops with a seven to eight of, of oil overlay. Uh, following ICSI, they're, put, they're moved to new 60 millimeter dishes of the same media. And then the next day after fertilization check, we move them, the zygotes are moved into uh, 30 microliter drops in 60, mil, 60 millimeter uh, OSAFE dishes. And we use global total, as I said, single step media uh, uh, protein is four mg per mil HSA and 0 0.6 mg per mil alpha and beta globulins. Uh, we use group culture, four to three to four embryos per drop, no observation uh, until day five, and uh, we don't do laser hatching on day three. Uh, next slide. 98% uh, of our procedures are either biopsy or freeze-all. 70% uh, are biopsied on day five, 25% on day six, and 5% on day seven. Uh, we do laser hatching at the time of biopsy and not before. So we either do it on day five or day six. So basically we do a 150 uh, uh, micron uh, zona laser shot, uh, blastocyst totally collapses prior to biopsy. And then uh, it looks, just looks like a collapsed moila. And then we go in with a pipette and uh, remove you know, five to six cells. Um, then we vitrify them. We move them to uh, corral dishes after the biopsy for holding until vitrification which it, then they're uh, vitrified on cryotops. We use Kitazato cryomedia after collapse. Uh, if they're not biopsied, uh, thawed blastocyst or laser hatched if they are not biopsied. And um, I said most, most of what we do are uh, uh, PGT and uh, freeze alls. We do, as I said, we do most of them, 70% are biopsy, 90% of bi uh, procedures are either biopsy or vit all. 59% uh, of our, we have 59% 50, usable fresh blastocyst development, 98% uh, cryo survival. We do all ESETs, uh, frozen embryo transfers, and our PGT delivery rate, 67%. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. All right, Bill Venier, San Diego Fertility Center. Are oh, you going to do some questions first? We're going to push this poll for just a few seconds and then we'll resume the presentation. Sounds good. Okay, I think you can start. I think everyone knows the, there's a poll there. Okay, um, Bill Venier, San Diego Fertility Center. Um, 
we use uh, group culture, so 35 millimeter dishes, 20 microliter droplets. We put up to five um, eggs, zygotes, embryos per drop. I say up to five, but uh, sometimes we have to squeeze one or two more in there. It depends on uh, how aggressive the docs are with their stimulation. We overlay that with three mils of olive oil. Um, just to uh, backtrack for a quick second, we strip the cumulus at TVA. So it goes from a four well dish, uh, stripped there, and then everything is put into the 35 millimeter dish. Uh, we do, uh, I guess, a single step uh, media, but we do change it on day three. Um, the reason we do that is we're looking at them on day three. Uh, we don't give them any grading. Uh, we're going by cleavage rate, so we'll, we'll uh, give a range to the physicians of uh, eight cells and above or less than eight cells, uh, just so they have or we have something to give to the, the patients and some type of feedback. Unless there is, uh, you know, something that we need to warn them about there where we don't have any eight cells and above and those types of things. So we do send out warning texts and emails to both the physicians and uh, the patients themselves. That way they're not shocked at the end. Um, we don't do any peaking on day two or day four. We uh, do not assist at hatch on day three. We um, collapse, I would call it more, at biopsy than assisted hatching. Uh, we are freeze all. So when they do come out of the freeze, uh, that's when we do our real assisted hatching. And I call it the JC method, the Joe Conahan method, where we lop off a big piece of that zona off. Um, and then we pH weekly. We use a tri gas. We use com commercially uh, bought tri gas. So I don't have too much control over it, but we're shooting for somewhere uh, around 7.3 pH, um, which again, we check weekly. Um, we do rotate incubators when we do pH checks. So uh, we'll do three a week uh, and then we'll ro rotate them to another incubator the following week. We just use a handheld Foldy Oyster pH meter. Um, the things we monitor that would be concerns of us, one is uh, the number of metaphase two eggs at retrieval. Um, that way we could, um, we have something to at least check to make sure, hey, is the stimulation good um, or are the docs giving us some poorly stimulated eggs here? So uh, I think that's pretty important. FERT rates, of course, uh, blastocyst conversion rates. We actually have a contract with the Navy. And if you think of any military, they're pretty precise and uh, to the point of how they do things. They don't really uh, waver and go outside their ranges. So uh, they're a very good control for us um, in all those uh, things that we do monitor. Um, so uh, next slide. Yep, okay, so the next slide for me was just why. Um, I'm raised on clinical IVF. I don't have much of a research background. Um, so I learned through uh, most of the people here on the panel, either directly or indirectly. So thanks to you all, this is the way I do things. So I'm learning stuff today, which is awesome. So uh, Nabil, thanks again for putting this together um, and really appreciate you inviting me to this. Another good thing for me is cap inspection. So I learn a lot through cap inspection on how people do things. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey everybody, um, my name is Tony Anderson. I am a, a multi-site lab director for Aspire Fertility out here in San Antonio. Um, I, I tried to go a different route because I agree with uh, just about everybody here. Um, you know, I like the way Kristen put it. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of right ways to do IVF. And one of the things I really try to uh, hammer home to a lot of my students when they're coming through training is, is sometimes we can't control the air. We don't really have the air filtration or, or uh, maybe some of the best equipment, but something that everybody here we can do is uh, control our pH, the osmolarity, and the temperature. And a number of people have talked about that. I personally use a single step media, um, kind of went through a system where I would, we did sequential medias and then I went to the single step and changed on day three, like a lot of people are doing here. Um, and now I just leave it in the single step uh, all the way through day six um, and uh, use everything like I, with uh, heapies based media. I know that there's some mops based uh, PBS uh, for handling your eggs and your embryos. Uh, when you're doing ICSI biopsies. Um, I, I actually use the medias that are pre-supplemented with protein so that I don't have to uh, have any mistakes in the lab where somebody may not know how to actually make a 10% solution. So I personally like mostly out of ease to use the single step medias. So go to the next slide. And one of the things I really had said I, I try to hammer home is a pH osmolarity and the temperature. Um, this is our pH meter, and we just actually just had a, this happened to us twice now. Um, you need to change your probe out at least annually, and we change our probes out every January. Um, our, we do our pHs once a month um, in our incubators, and we noticed this last month that pHs were off, they were high. So, but the embryos are looking amazing. So that's always kind of a great litmus test. Um, a lot of embryos on day five being biopsied and frozen. So I didn't believe that the pH was off. So we tried a different probe, the old probe that we had and uh, nothing changed. So we bought a new probe and our pH was, was right on. We run our pH around 725 to 735. More down at the lower end, 725, 7, 728 was our pH. Um, so you know, just recognizing what you need to do, whether you're going to raise or lower your pH to get the right pH. That's really key piece when I'm doing any troubleshooting in the lab. Go to the next slide. And the osmolarity, um, there's going to be a video here kind of playing as we go. Um, I've been making dishes the same way since uh, working with Klaus. I remember when we started doing oil cultures, we would um, remember how, like thinking about how much work that was to have to add oil to our culture system. But we actually fire polish a pipette, a Pasteur pipette, and um, underlay that media into the dish. Um, I just use the regular nunk dishes. I don't use any of uh, the, the fancier dishes, the GPS dishes or the corral dishes. So I don't know if you could underlay in those. A real key piece of this, making sure you can see from the picture on the side that your oil media is actually under your oil. There's been a couple of occasions where, you know, if a media drop merges together, it gets above the oil and um, now, you're, now your osmolarity is changing. Um, I always use to say it's the equivalent of putting a, a goldfish in a saltwater tank. It, it'll swim around a while, but it's going to die. And I think we'd actually do this a lot to our eggs, not really knowing that our osmolarity has changed. Let's go to the next slide. And finally, temperature. Um, you know, what are, the, what are we using to test our temperatures? Uh, we actually use this um, calibrated uh, uh, digital probe to test all of our temperatures every day. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, we always have seen those spring-loaded rigs that uh, are not very accurate or precise, or even these uh, little dials. They're actually great little quick tests, but uh, not anything you want to do in your actual accuracy. So, you know, I always tell uh, when someone's coming through doing their initial training embryology is that um, I love how uh, Rusty Poole will talk about not having any stage warmers in his uh, lab and his rates are spectacular. Um, and, but I don't know anybody who's actually written a paper on, um, on when the temperature is greater than 38. So uh, I try to work, you know, if you're going to err on temperature, err on the, uh, on the colder side of things. So we'll go to the next slide. And finally, um, where are we going with our culture systems? Uh, a lot of things that uh, we're seeing is the robotics and the in IVF. And what's this going to do to our uh, to our work workspace? Is it going to increase our bandwidth, where we can actually increase our volume, uh, open the access to care to more patients, and uh, 
And some of the systems we're currently using are like our hormone assays, hormone systems, but we still are uh, uh, not, uh, not open to using some of these uh, systems like the CASA systems in the lab. So it'll be interesting how the future goes in the future. So, so uh, thank you, Nabil, and I'll answer questions later. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nabil, for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, I've been using single embryo culture uh, system since the defined uh, media is available. I used to have uh, uh, sequential media, but uh, later on we uh, start using uh, single step. Uh, in my lab, uh, we are using uh, uh, vitro life uh, dishes and it takes around 20 microliters uh, drops and we cover them uh, with uh, oil and we culture them overnight and then next day we use them. And uh, for media we are using uh, global and we try to uh, set up the pH uh, between uh, 7.32, uh, between 7.32, 7.35 in Los Angeles. Uh, and we are getting best blasters development in this range with the global media. Uh, uh, we don't uh, do any hatching on day three, but day four for the, uh, 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 blastosis biopsy and uh, probably 98% of the patients do uh, biopsy. Very rarely we do fresh transfers and uh, uh, we don't do any assisted hatching uh, for the fresh transfers unless it's necessary but all FETs uh, we do uh, assisted hatching as uh, uh, we cut off uh, one third of the uh, zona pellucida. For the pH, we check uh, weekly uh, by ISTAT and uh, or when we change the media a lot during the cycle. And other than that, we keep going. Uh, I use uh, uh, dry incubators, MIRI, and also I use mink. So I constantly compare them in split cycles and I don't see any difference. So basically when you uh, adjust the conditions for uh, miri or mink, uh, you can get the same uh, results. So uh, for the continuous culture, we, use, we prepare dishes one day before and we use it until day six. No, uh, no uh, media changes or anything. We check embryos on day three and uh, do biopsy day five or day six. We do not check any uh, apoptosis or anything unless we see some morphologic changes from day five to day six. Then we look for some other environmental factors that affect our culture systems. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello, my name is Jürgen Lieberman. I'm a lab director in Chicago for TD Center of Illinois and uh, it's very interesting, you know, of the eight speakers, we, uh, we already realized we have eight different uh, culture systems and uh, we have more speakers and I'm sure we will end up with more different culture systems of eight. And before I just come to our culture system, I want to point out to everyone uh, that we have uh, important parts when just culture media, uh, a successful culture system requires more than just the right or so, you no know, culture media. For example, you know, the laboratory itself, the type of incubators you use, 
as a culture media uh, and do you, you know, take your QA and QC very seriously every day? And how well is your staff trained competency, competency and uh, superficiency? Next slide, please. Um, when we look at culture media and development, uh, we have really a good feeling that we have culture medium that is uh, dramatically improved over time. Uh, and uh, as we already see in the first eight uh, presentations before me, we have uh, very different culture media. And it's, it's important for everyone, you know, to have friends and look into their system and to get also an independent checkup for your culture system. If you look at the literature since uh, mid 90s, you know, you see a dramatic improvement and a dramatic switch from sequential media to single step media. So there is no doubt that we have at the moment very good culture media available. Next slide, please. If I would advise someone uh, you have, um, you know, to get an important and also successful system, I would summarize it like two with nine points. Um, you know, measure your CO2 every day uh, in an indirect way to measure your pH. Check your media, the pH on the actual working condition. We don't do that every day, but at least uh, every second, uh, second week. Check the temperature, it should be a part of the daily QC. Um, also make a you know, set schedule for evaluating your stuff in terms of competency and proficiency. You should set your own thresholds or um, key factors. Uh, for example, fertilization rate, how is your day free development, blastocyst formation, and uh, how many of these blastocysts you find you can vitrify. And of course, you know, your pregnancy rates you have to measure routinely. It's important also to look for sources of stress in your environment. Uh, uh, try to connect to colleagues and benchmark yourself with them. You know, it's no way to improve if you don't know how you're doing. So it's important to be in contact with other colleagues to see what they do and what results they achieve. Convert your culture on the reduced oxygen tension makes a practical sense, so low O2, and optimize your blastocyst culture by moving to a system, by uh, taking your embryos less out and looking at them and I would call it uh, based on Henry Lee's observation, quiet and silent culture. Next slide, please. And uh, at the moment, uh, we still have two existing systems, uh, you know, very much established years ago by David Gardner, the so sequential media that is based on the different compositions in the ovitus and in the urine environment in terms of uh, components and metabolism and by uh, later by um, different uh, people here is a single step media um, in terms of uh, let's embryo choose uh, by providing calculated concentration of uh, constituents may uh, be determined by BOSA. Next slide. So if we look at our system, how we do it, uh, starting with oocyte retrieval, we cutting the cumulus after the retrieval, we strip usually uh, an hour later, most cases or in our laboratory are ICSI cases. When we do ICSI, that's, uh, you know, from the time of stripping three to four hours, usually after launch in between one and two o'clock. Uh, after ICSI, also all sites get cultured in a four-well dish with a single-step media. When we prepare the media, we do it uh, the day before when it can equilibrate overnight. Each well contains a 700 microliter culture media overlaid with 400 microliter oil. Uh, so embryo culture uh, is done in bench tops under 5% uh, O2 and 7% CO2 and balanced N2. It's pre-mixed triple gas. We culture in these four wells, not more than 10 embryos per well, but it's a coop culture, no single embryo culture. Uh, fertilization check, when we do a mid-cycle evaluation on day three, just to have an idea if uh, we have no blastocyst formation, how at least looks day three, but that's only the day we checked on day three. And then we usually do day five uh, uh, transfers, freeze oils, biopsies, day five, day six, and day seven. Next slide, please. 
And uh, most important for all of us, uh, you know, never uh, believe you do well. You always have to look for new opportunities, ingenuity, and don't be afraid to make changes. But on the end, you have to find what works for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank you, um, thank uh, Nabil and Progenesis for providing this platform. Um, I'm mainly going to go through point by point, so we're very quick. Um, in our lab, we're using box incubator with 5% oxygen tension. We are using not free mixed gas, it's CO2 and N2. Usually 7 to 8% CO2 and N2 is off gas of LN2. We do retrieval and transfer inside the isolate that is enclosed area with 37 degree humidity and CO2. We strip them um, on the same condition except does not have CO2. We check embryo every day except day four um, under inverted microscope that has enclosure so that we can have CO2 and warm inside temperature. We do daily QC of temperature, CO2, O2 verification, and we do pH every day. Yes, every day pH. So we, everything comes to conduct with eggs and sperm, we test them, mouse embryo test. We off-gas some petri dishes overnight, at least overnight before use. And we use single culture media, single step, continuous. Uh, we called, we made them day minus one, the day before retrieval, usually before three o'clock, and so that at least we have 16, 17 hours prior to re retrieval. And we culture them up to day seven. We do change our media on morning of day four. So we try to buy the smallest bottle of the media is available so that when we open it, we finish it quickly, within two days usually, sometimes faster. We do a cooler medium with a culture medium at least for one week and keep it in, in the fridge. Uh, 15 to 20 ml of medium added to 100 ml of the bottle. Next, please. We will be wiped off, wipe off um, the surface of the hood prior to preparing dish. And obviously we use um, proper um, a name, a model number, and color code all our dishes. Media and oil are kept in the fridge. We take it out before we use it and we put it back inside the fridge as soon as we finish. We are using um, we are culturing an embryo individually in 15 to max 25 microliters of media that cover with all um, with 12 well dish uh, that is pre-made. We only make two dishes at a time, cover with oil before moving to um, making the next two dishes. I think uh, one line is missing that is talk talking about biopsy. We do not do hatching on day three or day four for biopsy. We just collapsing and then doing biopsy in the same day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hey, um, I'm Marlene Angle. I direct four laboratories, three of them I direct as the off-site lab director, the fourth I'm just starting at as the on-site. So my philosophy has been to hire well-trained technical supervisors, people that have been in the industry for a while, and then I tend to stand back. So I don't really micromanage the labs unless there's a problem. So I'm gonna show you generally what my four labs do, four different systems, Pretty much everybody's a little different, but outcomes tend to be pretty close in terms of pregnancy rates. 
So in San Francisco, we use dry incubators. We use, I'm blanking on the type of dishes, the name of the dishes, but we use the vitro life dishes. They think have 16 small wells. We put one to three embryos per droplet. Uh, global total media. We do no hatching on day three. We do greater than 80, probably closer to greater than 90% of our cycles are all ICSI and biopsy these days. Um, we do a media change on day three, but other than that, we don't take the, the dishes or the embryos out. Our pH runs around 7.31 to 7.35. And um, most of our transfers are single embryo. So in New Mexico at, um, at Caperton Fertility Institute, we use Labatech incubators. They do use group culture and GPS dishes, global total. They will do hatching on day three. This is a program that runs in batches. They do 100% ICSI, 100% biopsy, 100% freeze all, and their average embryo transfer is about 1.06 embryos. Um, so it's pretty much a single embryo transfer with frozen embryos. They do a, a media change on day three. We have um, the Labotex are a humidified incubator. They do pH and uh, CO2 testing with each new, um, each new series and each new set of, of um, premixed gases. And next slide, please. In North Carolina, um, it's a, a pretty busy lab. They use exclusively embryo scope for all of their patients. It's single embryo culture, obviously, being in the embryo scope. They use global total. They do no hatching. It's a freeze-all program with greater than 80% biopsy. Uh, they do do a media change, but other than that, they don't ever take the, the dishes out of the, the embryo scope. They have um, the life air uh, handling system there. They, have, they measure pH and CO2 levels with each new lot of um, gases. And then the newest lab I have is the University of Wisconsin. They use big box forma incubators. They do group culture. They are doing hatching. They do a much smaller percentage of biopsy. I'm trying to encourage them to move to a freeze-all. Um, they do larger numbers of transfers also. It's probably closer to two embryos per transfer, they do do a media change on day three. Um, but they, they have an older lab, and it has some of their handling capabilities, but not all. And again, their, uh, their media is global total. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you for um, inviting me to share our embryo culture system at the Mainline Fertility. Um, we're located uh, near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So we do use the uh, Thermoforma incubators. Um, the main reason why is because we do do individual culture of our embryos. However, I do think it's really important um, to have the infrared censored incubators the reason why is because after a door opening, they do recover. The gas concentrations do recover very quickly. Um, these incubators have the HEPA filtration. We also have inline uh, VOC filters. Um, we bought the, uh, the special doors, uh, the inner doors that have two individual doors per shelf, and then there's a large glass door. The whole thing has a water jacketed uh, to maintain uh, temperatures. Also, with this type of incubator, you can really fine tune your pHs. Um, we are running currently around a 7.2% CO2, and of course, we, uh, we use a low, low um, oxygen incubators. Next slide, please. So, uh, Progenesis asked us to talk uh, a little more about our pH and our gas monitoring. Uh, pH is ex extremely important. We measure it with a new lot and then um, 
about every other week. We measure the gases um, every single morning. And, and we also will check once in a while with the fire, right? Uh, the manual method. And I didn't put it in this slide, but we use a thermocouple and we actually measure the temperature of the, the drops or the media in the dishes um, instead of using uh, surface thermometers. So um, we use a thermocouple to check the temperatures of just about everything in the lab every single morning. Next slide, please. In terms of our embryo culture, um, you know, at the time of retrieval, we use a heaps buffered medium that's covered with oil uh, to maintain osmolality and also temperature, prevent evaporation. Um, and then we will trim the cumulus cells in that heaps buffered medium. Then they're rinsed and they're placed in the organ well culture dish, which you see there in the middle. We put about a mil of media in the middle and cover it with oil. And we will co-culture or group culture up to eight um, eggs um, per dish. Then um, on day one, after the fertilization check, then we will switch to um, individual embryo culture. So we'll use the single embryo culture from day one all the way out to day seven. We were also asked as speakers to comment about whether or not we do assisted hatching. We very, very rarely will do assisted hatching on day three. Now, of course, if we're going to be doing trophectoderm biopsy, we will make a hole um, in the zona for the trophectoderm biopsy. But overall, we don't do assisted hatching. Uh, next slide, please. For embryo evaluation, um, we, we, we still look at morphology. Uh, we will look at them only on, of course, day one for fertilization check, and then we'll look at them again on day three. So in other words, we don't look at them on day two, and we don't look at them on day four. And then once they become blastocysts, we'll look at them um, on day five, day six, and day seven. So we do probably about 75% of our cases um, are PGT, A, and freezals. Next slide, please. Um, in the future, in, in my opinion, I think the future is uh, non-invasive biomarkers of uh, embryo competence. Uh, PGT, of course, I think is here to stay. Metabolomics. Also, um, I'm a fan of uh, time-lapse morphokinetics. Uh, we've tried several systems over the years. I think the time-lapse morphokinetics in, in conjunction with artificial intelligence. And then also just combining that concept with undisturbed culture. In other words, just leaving them um, in the machine and not pulling them out to, to, uh, to grade or evaluate the embryos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Xing Li Yan, and I'm a lab director in the Care Bay Area, in uh, Careful Bay Area, and it's in um, um, California. And I have on one slide here, I uh, heard uh, the um, other lab this talk, and then I think our system is pretty much uh, like uh, Ma Dr. Malin Angle and uh, David Winninger. So basically, um, we have a global media system and uh, we use the mirror, system, mirror incubator, so why? Uh, I think that these days, uh, um, so many media choices in the market, everyone has a favorite, right? Uh, uh, probably all the media are good. Uh, so uh, we choose this media because uh, at that time we tested uh, one media versus another. And then uh, for like 2,000 uh, embryos, like totally split, uh, split, uh, sibling. So it looks like this media at that time gave us the, like 10% of uh, uh, better blastocyst development. So <laughs> that make uh, uh, Peggy, the sales rep, so excited. She said, oh, you should publish it. But hey, I think everyone probably has uh, his own system works for him. So we pick this media and then, uh, but uh, in the meantime, I realized that we use a mirroring 
uh, which is a dry incubator is good and but uh, you know uh, this uh, a disadvantage of because it's dry incubator uh, so uh, we used to use eight mil of oil because of that we um, added uh, more volume of oil uh, and the lifeguard oil is like heavy oil probably works better uh, even that so when i measured the uh, um osmolarity and then i find out uh, and so if day one is uh, uh, 260 that osmolarity by day three or four and uh, that will increase into 100, 280. So that made me thinking I probably want to change it on day three. Uh, I, uh, so by at that time we used eight mil and the osmolality was like a go to 290. So I thought, okay, maybe it's for safer side, um, just change on day three. Later I tested uh, without changing, um, it, it is good too. So I, I guess uh, between 260 to 200 to 300, uh, also my life is pretty much, uh, you know, tolerated. Uh, otherwise, uh, our system is pretty much uh, um, similar with other people, you know, we have two group culture and the three embryos in, in drop and then measure pH uh, every week and measure um, CO2 every day and we change the media on day three but not do hatching. Uh, hatching is doing is done at the time of biopsy if we do biopsy if it's a fresh transfer no um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me, Nabil? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I just wanted to say that it's very interesting to hear everybody else's talks. Uh, we do uh, a la carte menu of uh, pick and choose of, you know, very similar to what others are doing. I will echo what Kristen said that um, there are many right ways to do things. And I think we saw that today. And also what Marlene said, I also direct labs aside from Montefiore. Um, I have five labs in total and they all have slightly different systems and they all work well. When I measure the uh, KPIs every month, there are very little variation, which just proves that the systems are all really robust. So at Monty, um, you know, I'm just gonna go through these quickly because I feel like we've talked about this already. We use global FERT media for the retrievals and insemination, that's on day zero. The media arrives already complete. Um, we do not do mouse testing. On day one through seven, we use the NXC media, which is the low lactate media from Irvine, and it has gentamicin added. And as I um, also already mentioned, both media arrive with HSA already added. So we're not manipulating the media um, very much when it arrives. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. Um, all the incubators are like everyone else's, low oxygen. Ours are humidified. We have benchtop planers. Uh, we do measure the incubator temperature daily and we use a calibrated thermocouple for that. Um, of course, the media always utilizes the bicarbonate buffering system to CO2 incubator uh, with low oxygen. We do test each lot of media for pH when it arrives in-house. So that is the one testing we do for each new series, which is basically monthly. And of course, everyone stores their media you know, in the refrigerator, we use um, parafilm to reduce the amount of ev evaporation. We do not tend to go back to open bottles. We open new bottles each time we make dishes and we work in laminar flow hoods. I mean, it's very similar to what everyone is doing. We do culture always in micro drops. We use the GPS dishes and it's under oil. We happen to use ove oil. I think that's a really good oil. Um, the embryos are grown singly or in pairs. We really don't grow them in these micro drops for more, more than two of them. And of course, we don't change the media on day three. That's probably related to that. We don't have a large volume so we don't load them with embryos and uh, we just do one or two uh, per drop. 
We do not hatch on day three. Uh, only about 25% of our patients get PGT, but we do a lot of freeze-alls. So we tend to hatch at the time of biopsy and we tend to hatch at the time of uh, freezing and then again at transfer. Uh, if it's indicated, we don't do that routinely. And we don't do any further monitoring of the physiological changes in the embryos. We don't measure the condition media. We don't look at reactive oxygen species or anything like that. And I'm happy to say that all of the labs perform really well. The systems seem to be really robust and fine-tuned and um, there are so many good systems out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, next slide. I'm not gonna do any introductions. I just wanna show you that, whoops, go back one more for a minute. Uh, so this is what, one of my mottos. If we have data, we'll look at the data, decide what we do. But if all we have are opinions, then let's use mine. And uh, I think that's a good thing that demonstrates that we all have different views. We look at things differently. We may still see the truth, even though we uh, interpret it differently. We may still have the same truths. Next slide. Now, instead of going ahead and giving you answers, I decided I was gonna ask questions. And so I'll just leave this up as kind of what we do. Realize that um, I am a lab director. I've been a IVF lab director for a long time, almost as long as Kristen Avani. And uh, I uh, am now working at an egg bank. So we don't make a lot of embryos. We do make some, but I'm also an uh, offsite lab dir director at a couple of uh, IVF labs. So I'm involved in it. So what do I do? I want to ask you some questions. Um, first of all, um, do you use an isolate? If you use an isolate, what is the CO2 concentration in your isolate? Because as Sharon Anderson uh, mentioned earlier, whether you use a thermal conductivity meter or an infrared meter will determine how quickly that CO2 will recover. And most of these isolates have thermal conductivity meters. So think about what you're using those isolates for and how long you expect them to have the correct CO2 concentration to give you your correct pH. Add to that, how does an oocyte control its pH? Uh, Brian Lamanto, uh, one of uh, our embryologists, is looking at that for his PhD project, but we don't think that it controls its uh, pH very well, and, nor does it control its osmolality very well. So we've developed all these things for embryos, but we've left out the ideal culture system for oocyte. What is that? Um, the second thing I'd like to ask, everyone uses supplemental media that's modified with heaps or mops to work um, outside of the incubator. What temperature are you using that media? Because the pH will be different whether you use it at 37 degrees or whether you use it at room temperature. And if you wanna do the ideal thing, uh, you're not gonna use the same heaps medium for room temperature and at 37 degrees centigrade. I propose that everyone should probably measure the pH of their modified media so that they will have a good handle on it to see whether it's appropriate. Um, second thing I'd like to ask everyone is what are the concentrations of the components in the media that you're using? And I wanna really bring into focus here, are you using media that already contains protein or media which you add the protein? And realize if you're adding protein to the media, you're diluting everything out except the water and except the protein by 10% if you're adding 10% protein. How does that affect the embryos as you're culturing them? We don't know, but I think it's one thing that people don't uh, focus much on. Uh, finally, uh, what type of media, whether to use single or sequential has come up. I've used very successfully both systems. They work very well. But my system has always been to try to make things as simple as possible. Um, at one time I did a, a split comparison of sister oocytes um, between single and sequential media. And I had a slight benefit that was statistical using single as opposed to sequential. 
Does that tell you though that sequential is better? Or does it tell you that maybe I don't know how to culture very well in sequential media? So these are things that I'd like to propose for you. The rest is up here. One more slide and I'm done. And this is what we use um, for our system, not for culturing, but for vitrification. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, we have uh, uh, taken a poll, um, asking a few questions. Uh, let's look at the poll. Uh, William, do you want do you want to go through the poll results? Yes. Um, so the first question that we asked um, the audience um, was, "What culture media setting do you use?" Um, Seventy-one percent of respondees said a single-step media. Um, Twenty-nine percent said a media change on day three or day four. Um, and the second question that we asked was, um, do you monitor pH, temperature, and other variables? 97% uh, said yes, they do. 3% said no. Um, the next question we asked was, how do you culture your embryos? 71% uh, of respondees said that they do a group embryo culture. 29% um, said they do a single embryo culture. Um, question four was, do you hatch? 68% uh, of respondees said yes, they do. Um, the fifth question that we asked was, why do you choose to use your current culturing system, which was a multiple choice answer. And uh, the most popular response was a better clinical outcome, um, followed by less impact on the embryo viability, uh, and then convenience, as well as others. Thank that's you so it. much. Thank You're you welcome. so much. Very interesting. I'm going to... Um, uh, touch base on the last question, which is how did you choose and why are you choosing your current system? Do you guys think that, uh, you know, convenience is an important factor in, in because, you know, a, a lot of clinics here are handling a, a large number of patients and sometimes you have to choose a practical way. Do we have any data that shows that one system is better than the other or is really convenience that play a role here? I'll take anyone who wanted to answer the question. Well, I would say data as far as outcome must be monitored and we are more than willing to change our processes as far as um, increase time slots per patient or um, change any other aspect if it's giving us a better outcome, even if it's 10% higher pregnancy rates or ongoing pregnancy rates. Um, so I would say no, convenience is certainly not very heavily weighted, although it is important and it's a factor that we consider. Very good. K Klaus, uh, I see that you, you may want to have a... a yeah, we, we chose our culture system because, I mean, during my PhD work, we really studied a lot how embryos interacted with culture media components. And we really found that when embryos were exposed to glucose and all the amino acids, we just had so much better embryo development. And this is before, uh, this is when we were working in the 80s with KSAW Medium, even before the advent of Global. We just didn't see the same results as David Gardner did with these very strict time periods, you know, where pre and post uh, genomic activation. But rather, we found that when glucose is present, which used to get a really bad rap. Everybody used to think that glucose was this bad thing that pushed the embryos into glycolytic, into, glu into glycolysis sooner than, than they needed to. That's a yes and a no. If you have amino acids present, then the amino acids are probably the great regulator of metabolism, at least in an in vitro system. So that's kind of how I came about with you know, going to a single step media? Was it just physiologically made more sense? Because we tend to compare in vitro to in vivo. And in my opinion, that's a little bit of a fallacy since the systems are so different. Thank you so much. Any other comments from the panel? I agree with what I also feel that um, there's a little bit of convenience in there, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I think I would use the word maybe more streamlined and safer. You know, the fewer times we take the dishes out, the better. Um, and whatever we can do to optimize our culture system, which I think is the best thing we can do. You know, I've used both. We switched from sequential years ago and, and never looked back. So 
Uh, and it just happens to be way more convenient. It saves on supplies, it saves on lab time, everything. And I also think when you look at this practically, most of us have not, have increased our embryologist workload in terms of we're doing more freezing, we're doing more biopsy, we're culturing longer. And most of us, I would say, while we might have increased our volumes, we haven't increased our staffing proportionally for most cases. I think that's the biggest thing I wrestle with in all of my programs is staffing and the perception of overwork, long days, multiple days in a row. And uh, anything I think you can do to streamline the process and make it easier for the people at the bench top without compromising your outcomes is important. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Marlene, you, you're running a, a, a few labs, and I think S Sangeeta also was uh, mentioning that she, she runs few labs, and some of you are also uh, helping other labs. Do you see differences in outcome when you look at this different uh, culturing system? Um, this is Sangeeta. No, I, I mean, within a few standard deviation points, but really it's not significant um, clinically. The, the systems are great. The staff are comfortable with them. The, um, it really depends on the patients and the, the way that they practice. The PGT labs are a little bit different, but um, the 100% PGT labs, but I would say that's related to the to the patients, but the KPIs in the lab, the fertilization rates, the blastocyst conversion rates, those things are very consistent. I would agree completely. Very good. Um, Kim raised a few questions. Does any one of you wanted to take him on those questions that he raised at the end of the presentation? He, he did bring up a great question about, you know, the use of media like collect. Uh, that's the collect media. Most people probably don't realize that when HEPI's buffered solutions are pH, they're pH at room temperature. And years ago when I was working with Don Rieger and I said, well, why are we pHing all the media to work at room temperature because buffering capacity is is a function of temperature. So we came up with the idea of a, you know, checking, in other words, you should warm the media and then establish the pH because, you know, a lot of these medias that we use for either micro manipulation at the oocyte stage or at the embryo biopsy stage, we certainly don't want the, those manipulation medias to be stressors. And I think that's going to have big impacts on, on subsequent development in your culture system. So the point of using a an amino acid supplemented media is a great idea. And David Hill years ago had an abstract that showed that he had actually better pregnancy rates when he did something, he did embryo biopsy in an amino acid supplemented uh, media. Excellent. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah I'd like to add that uh, when you're using the HEPIS buffered media, I'm not sure about the MOPS buffered. Um, there's actually a little bit of sodium bicarb in these medias. And if you put it into a CO2 incubator, rather it's tight capped or not, or in a, in a 1006 uh, ICSI dish, enough CO2 is getting in there that it could alter your pH. So um, if you are heating it up, make sure you're just using a block warmer or a dry incubator for heating those medias up. Excellent. Uh, I have a question actually, rather than uh, a statement about, the, about your question, Nabil. Um, from a the the theoretical speaking, I mean, we can always say that, uh, you know, temperature, of course, is a, is a big factor in terms of contr uh, controlling the pH. Uh, but uh, co uh, chemicals like HEPIs, as far as I know, uh, has a very uh, robust and large uh, buffering capacity. I mean, does anybody have actual data that shows, uh, you know, those HEPIs buffered uh, uh, media uh, pH is depending on say room temperature versus uh, 37 degrees Celsius. Does anybody have data on that? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, Don Rieger and I spent probably two years evaluating the effects of temperature on pH, and without a doubt, 
it makes a huge difference on how the media pH is depending on the temperature that you actually set the pH at because the buffer is relative to temperature. So for instance, I mean, what is it, for instance, if you get a, a pH buffer, one of those commercial available pH, uh, uh, I mean, commercial, commercially available heat piece uh, buffered media, and then just look at the pH at the room temperature versus 37 degrees Celsius. So like so some what, media- What range are we looking at? So if you pH media that say at room temperature that's heat piece buffered, it's gonna come in, you know, between 7.5 and 7.3, but if you take that same solution and warm it up, it's gonna come in considerably lower than that. It's gonna come closer to 7.2. 7.2, okay. Roughly. It's been a long time since I did it, but it, it's, it's much lower than you'd think. Um, earlier, uh, Sheila raised a point on the uh, single step uh, culture and the um, uh, oil integrity and toxicity. Do you guys have any data on possible um, impacts on integrity and toxicity for oil in, when you have a single step media? Does anyone have any uh, comments on this? So the reason that I raised that question was because media replenish for media replenishment um, when using a single step culture media was advised um, to at the maximum of five days into the culture. So whenever you're culturing your embryos in the single step media and going over the five day mark, the concern is not necessarily the medium composition, but rather the um, toxicity levels of the oil. And so that my, I raised the question to the panelists that are you, for those of us that are culturing post the five day mark, have you consider the toxicity levels in the oil um, or associate it, the oil integrity to your outcomes as far as losses of conversion rates. Jim? Yeah, there's a study done by a Japanese group that looked at the oxidation of oil that was supposedly affected by um, exposure to light and temperature. And uh, when people have tried to make toxic oil, by exposing to light in higher temperatures, they failed to do it. And uh, so, although it's theoretically possible, you know, I don't know that we understand all the factors involved in making the toxic uh, oil toxic. Hey, Klaus? Yeah, um, do you, everybody knows who Antonia Gilligan is, right? I mean, she's probably the expert on, on this area. Years and years ago, she and I did some studies and found that uh, uh, sterine, which is a nasty VOC, is highly absorbed in oil. Uh, and then what happens is over a five day period that it not, uh, the sterine, I'm sorry, sterine will actually move into the micro drops on the fifth or sixth day. So what Ad Antonia was saying was that how long you culture in the drops it's more of a function of how clean your air is. And before you go to single step media, you know, it would probably be worthwhile to do some sibling studies to make sure, because Sheila, you're absolutely right. If you wait too long and your air system isn't right, your, your oil will act like a sink for the VOCs, particularly benzenes and a lot of these toluenes and aldehydes, and they move into the micro drops once the oil becomes saturated. Now they move in at very slow rates because their water solubility is much less than their oil solubility. But Antonia Gilligan probably has the most data of anybody on this. Very good. Uh, there was another point that was raised by uh, the panel by David uh, regarding the uh, uh, laser hatching. Um, just prior to biopsy, is there any benefits to it? And, I, and I've seen a certain trend of more embryologists uh, doing that techniques. Any any comments on the panel? Yeah, there is no benefit to do it earlier. Yeah, what I see is the uh, uh, many more trophectoderm cells if you don't breach the zona on day three. I just think that uh, you leave it alone um, I just, I've seen, uh, we've, we've received some embryo, frozen embryos that have been 
uh, hatched on day three and vitrified and um, biopsied. And the zonas, uh, a lot of times, are thicker. The number of trophectoderm cells are fewer. So uh, I've always been a fan of just leaving, leaving them alone. I culture from day one to day five and then six. Uh, and then hatch at the time, but and I just think the expansion is greater, the number of trophectoderm cells is greater, and uh, I just think it's more natural uh, leaving them alone and just letting them continuing to grow like uh, an embryo that you weren't going to do biopsy on, that you just continue to culture, and then you just zap it just real quick to collapse it, and then you put your your pipette in the hole and uh, pull out five or six cells and laser them off. And I just think uh, you're taking a, a lesser percentage of the embryo when you're doing that, when you have so many more trophectoderm cells. At least that's what I've seen. Kim? Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering the right question, but if it's regarding whether to do assisted hatching on day three or at the time of biopsy, for me, the time of biopsy, number one, you're biopsying fewer embryos because you're only going to be you're about half because you're only biopsying those that are made into blastocysts. And the second thing is sometimes when you hatch on day three, the inner cell mass will come out of that hatched area. And so you avoid that. You can pick the area. You can pick an area with lesser trophectoderm if you want, well away from the inner cell mass. So I think that's one of the reasons why I prefer to do the biopsies on day five, six, or seven. Is, is the integrity of the embryo more protected when you do hatching at the, at the five or at the biopsy date? I don't know. You can make a case for both of them. Yeah. You can make a case right. that you could hatch at an area between cells on day three, um, while on day five, you can say that you're going to hatch closer to those cells, but you're going to you're going to end up pulling them out for the biopsy anyway. I see Zeki has some. Yeah, I, I like to say something about this, of course. Um, as far as far as the, as far as the timing of zona breach concerned, uh, that thickness of zona. I mean, uh, as, as mentioned before, if you just uh, breach the zona at day three, at the zona is going to be thick at the time of biopsy. Uh, but this is this is this has two uh, two uh, two ways of uh, helping you and also uh, you know giving you some uh, problems later down the road. Uh, a thick zona helps you, I mean, it makes, makes the uh, biopsy easier, at least to my uh, experience, because, because a thicker zona is gonna give you, a, a, you know, higher resistance. You can uh, easily bi biopsy it much easier compared to, you know, an ex uh, completely expanded and thin zona. Uh, it's keeping a hold on the thin zona and then uh, doing the biopsies, uh, it's harder, at least, I don't know, depending on what type of technic technique you are using, it might be different, but from my experience, just uh, biopsying a day three uh, hatched uh, embryo is much easier because of the uh, tension on the zona or uh, tension on the zona, basic, that, that's, that's it. But when you, uh, when you allow uh, this, th this thing to happen, uh, during the uh, during the time of uh, during the time of uh, biopsy on day five or six, of course, you got you might have those issues we are discussing, like uh, ICM uh, ICM is uh, hashing out, uh, and it, it make it makes your uh, uh, biopsy harder. Uh, but also that uh, you know thick zona might be an issue while you are thawing those. But our uh, our solution to that generally after you thaw the embryos. Uh, you can basically give a larger, a big uh, cut on the zona, basically, to help uh, uh, to help embryo recover after freezing the thaw cycle. But I mean, it's, it's a double, double, uh, double, uh, double side, uh, I mean, double edged uh, question, basically. It helps on one side to biopsy, my experience at least, but also creates issues down the road. But uh, there are solutions to each, depending on how you uh, how you look at it. Yeah, very good. Uh, I think I think it's important to keep that option, but you can make a choice where you do the biopsy, as Kim pointed out, and if you make an earlier uh, opening, you know, you know you lost that option, and at the day of biopsy, you know you have uh, different options on an embryo to 
go in and do biopsy and you want to choose that exactly right before the biopsy. We also notice that we may not be able to um, have the you know timing for the biopsy. Sometimes the embryo may not be ready to biopsy today if the hash overnight might be completely hash. For that reason, we're no longer doing day three or day four biopsy. Very good. Sheila, thank you so much. Sheila? Yes. Is anyone concerned um, that considered biopsying, or excuse me, assisted hashing on day three versus live um, during the biopsy process of the actual temperature fluctuations within the drop? Because many of us who culture uh, using group culture can have upwards of five or six embryos per droplet and assisted hatching all of those embryos in the same droplet can increase your temperature in the droplet. Um, and as Dr. Winnegar mentioned that he said that he notices more trifectogram cells for embryos that are not assisted hatched on day three versus the ones that are. So I guess my question to all of the panelists is, do you um, compare single set, single culture versus group culture when it's assisted hatching on three? Um, as far as the quality of embryo on day five and six. In other words, is the um, assisted hatching on day three for single cultured embryos, the temperature is lower because less pulses of the laser per droplet would then ultimately increase the quality of embryo on day five and six. Any comments on that? Have you actually measured these changes in temperature or is this just theoretical? It's in theory. Yeah, I should mention there, there was a study done. I'm not sure if it's been published yet, but I did uh, read or review a study that looked at the mouse model and looked at doing multiple zaps with the laser and changing uh, uh, the intensity of the laser pulse. And they found that at least the mouse embryo was very impervious to any of uh, disturbances, development to blastocyst stage, um, a further development, I should say because of using high laser impulses. Doesn't answer the question, but. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? I have a question. So do you, does it, do the panelists think that the pressure that's caused by an intact zona, in other words, this creates some blastocele pressure. Do you think this pressure is involved in proliferation of the trophectoderm cells? Because I agree I agree with David. My impression of embryos that are hatching, that they have less trophectoderm cells than blastocysts that are intact. And they also seem to be patchy, large, more squamous type looking versus a really nice tight epithelial cells. So I'm just curious if the blastocele cavity, if that pressure is important in trophectoderm development and proliferation. Tony? Yes, I, I would think so, yes. What do you think, Tony? Um, yeah, I actually read an article. Uh, it was a book I found at a, at a local uh, beach library I was in that it was uh, uh, eth Ethics and Embryo Research. It was a really bizarre book to find. And in there was a uh, some comments from Jonathan Van Blurkum. And I, I like the idea about the pressure, but the idea was he said that, you know, assisted hatching was just kind of implemented to help improve the hatching and implantation, but um, the more natural way for it to, to grow is to not hatch it and to, we're, we're perhaps by, by putting a hole in the zona, allowing embryos to hatch that through nature, the natural selection of embryos would not normally hatch on their own anyway. And so I'm not a big fan of hatching, haven't been a big fan, but um, it, you know, we actually hatch on day three I would prefer to go to day five, but changing everybody in the lab seems to be the, the challenge in, in my lab right now. <laughs> we, we match on day three, and I, I just speak from personal experience that I much prefer hatching on day three. Um, I think that the embryos grow fine. I think that the trophectoderm herniates out just fine on most of them. If you look at the embryo behind Klaus, um, I would find that embryo very easy to biopsy, even with the ICM all the way out. So we, we did try for a couple months. I, I do agree that the embryos are definitely more expanded. They definitely have more trophectoderm cells, but um, 
boy, it was like a, a mutiny and a revolt in our lab, including me, because it was so much harder and it took so much longer. And we didn't see any difference in pregnancy rate, any difference in blast conversion. So everyone was very happy when we went back to, we hatch early in the morning on day three and we are generally done biopsying on the morning of day five by nine o'clock. So um, they still grow just fine in my opinion. That's great to know, Kristen. I've never I've heard, heard anybody we, compare we the two. And we have to hatch on day three as well. What about the amount that you hatch? I mean, I heard Levent a while ago. He's talking about, didn't you say one third of the no, uh, no, 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 no. zoner? Kim, uh, I, I hatch on day four for biopsy. And the reason is that uh, most of the time I can predict the uh, blast fluation site. So that's why I hatch on day four. But when I throw the embryos, you know, then I cut the one third of the zona after throwing, you know, oh. okay, not not before. So, oh. but I'm, I'm also uh, on the side of the, you know, the hatching uh, on day three or day four. I never, I mean, I did few, but I usually do on day four and it's easy to biopsy and then uh, we never see any side effect or the bad effect of the hatching. Uh, so it, they grow fine and you can do biopsy uh, uh, quicker and you handle the embryos very well. As, as far as this hashing business concern, I have another observation and also maybe a question for you, Nabil. Um, especially if you're doing a group culture and then hatching on day three. I mean, it, I had happened to me a couple of times, not very often, but when the embryo started to hatch on day three, I mean, after day, day, day three, is in certain cases, I end up with uh, hatching blastocysts that are really, uh, you know, conjoined together. So they, 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 just look, just, they just look like congenital twins. I mean, I was just even joking about it. And uh, if you're going to go ahead and biopsy those, I mean, I'm, all, I'm, I'm scared of the possibility of, you know, exchanging some of the cells between those uh, embryos. And does anybody, I mean, do people see this type of observation? And also, Nabil, if, say, assume I have a, 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 a situation like this, I mean, two embryos are attached together, a trough accident, I just pull them apart and then say one embryo just ended up <laughs> exchanged between them. And uh, if, if it is going to be in my um, biopsy sample, so what is, the, what is the likelihood of it screwing up my sample, I mean, results basically? I would say about 10 years ago, we observed that. And David, I think um, you remember that. And I that remember. That's why we stopped. Yeah, so uh, we, we came through that uh, also. Um, if they didn't pull apart easily, um, that we would laser them apart. We would take the biopsy from a different part of the embryo. Yeah. So, so we would still idea. biopsy, but we would take from yeah. trophectin terms on the opposite side of what we just separated, something along those lines. That's another reason why we, we stopped doing um, hatching on day three also. You guys are uh, making just to, Yeah, just to throw it out there. Uh, when we did day three assisted uh, a hatching for biopsy, the majority of our biopsies were day five. Now, without doing AH, uh, we biopsy the ma majority of ours on day six, and we do carry out to day seven also. Um, but uh, that's just if you, if you biopsy them one egg per drop, you don't have that issue. I mean, one uh, blastus per drop. And that's what, you know, that's what we've always done. If you culture them. Well, yeah, yeah, we've already separated them singly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. on, a, on a side note to, to uh, kind of piggyback on what Bill said, we saw the same thing when we stopped hatching on day three, we saw more embryos on day six. And our, we do a lot of PGT. And in our lab, the number one determining factor of euploidy was day of biopsy. So. That was one of the compelling reasons also for us to switch back because more embryos biopsied on day five gave us more euploid embryos regardless of patient age. So that's yeah. just a note. 
Yeah, we don't see that. We we still biopsy most of ours on day five, uh, the majority, mm -hmm. um, and and then uh, I would say sixty five, seventy percent on day five, and then maybe twenty five percent on day six, five percent day seven. Have you seen any differences in outcome comparing day six to day seven or day five, six, and seven? Day seven, uh, they tend to be more aneuploid than the other two days. Um, I think that's pretty prevalent uh, no matter who we use. Um, we try to get that information. And uh, there is not much difference, at least for us, between day five and day six. The one, it's day seven that really shows a difference in you forty your rate. Not, not much difference in terms of pregnancy rates? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Clinical outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So we, 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 we definitely uh, monitor that. We see higher definitely. and also higher Sorry. pregnancy after transferring day fives compared to day sixes. Would you say? Our first choice is to transfer day five. Wow. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any other comments or um, question? Uh, on the panel, we have had some questions from the audience, and I think they, they were all answered. Uh, but I would like to get the last comments um, from your guys before we wrap up the, the webinar. Very good. So let's look at the uh, poll results. I think we have a second poll. Uh, we asked the audience if they would be interested in a multi center spent media research. There are 45% uh, said yes, 38% said maybe. And we asked them if uh, the, the webinar has clarified some of their questions, 74% said yes. And uh, if they would like to see a webinar like this, 98% said yes. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for your feedback and for your expertise. I'm sure a lot of embryologists are, I mean, look at the time, it's uh, 4.45. And we still have 87 participants, uh, 87 people watching the webinar that just uh, tell how much uh, value you guys are providing. Uh, with this, uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. I would like to thank each one of you for your expertise and for your contribution. Um, next week on Wednesday, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we're gonna have a webinar, uh, a patient focused webinar on stimulation protocol. So if, if you're interested in stimulation protocol, you're welcome to attend. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will see you next week. Thanks to Bill for putting it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Safe and valid. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.